As the holiday season gets into full swing, for many, it's a time of being with family and loved ones, sending cards, decorating trees, and cooking delicious food, plus some concerns about Santa's safety in the midst of nuclear testing. We'll learn about that and other holiday topics from the archives, all on this week's episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Welcome to this week's episode of JFK 35, a podcast by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. I'm Jamie Richardson. Matt Porter will be off today. The archives at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum is home to millions of items, including documents, photographs, sound and video recordings, and oral histories. For a number of reasons, only a fraction of them are readily accessible to the public, either in the museum here or online in the digital archives. As archivists come across this material in the course of their jobs, processing, digitizing, declassifying, aiding the public as they do research, they get to see some really interesting pieces. These might not get to be part of an exhibit or get in the queue for digitization or make it into our social feeds. So archivists have recently started a display in the lobby of the museum to share some of their favorite photos and documents. This round of picks has selections for the fall and winter seasons. With the holiday season and a new year upon us, I'm excited to have three of the archivists here with me today to chat about their picks. With me is Stacey Chandler, textual reference archivist, Mary Rose Grossman, AV reference archivist, and Laura Kintz, archivist for textual and photographic digitization. Welcome. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, so it's exciting to have three archivists here with us today, and you all do, I believe, slightly different things. So can you all let us know, what do you do in the course of your day? What types of things do you come across? Uh, this is Mary Rose. I am an audiovisual reference archivist, so I work with audiovisual materials, photographs, audio and moving image recordings, and I'm basically a customer service person who connects people with the historical resources. So I do a lot of customer service, you know, talking about things for people's various book writing, production, Hollywood. My father was in the Navy or in the White House purposes, so connecting people to the resources. Um, and this is Laura, and I am an archivist for textual and photographic digitization. So I uh, am responsible for uh, getting our materials up online on our website so that people anywhere in the world can see them. Um, and I work with both textual and photographic materials, primarily with uh, the White House Photographs Collection, which has a lot of really great photos from throughout JFK's presidency. And so I get to see a lot of really interesting people and places, and it's fun to be able to get those out so that anyone anywhere can see them. This is Stacy. I'm a textual reference archivist. I basically do what Mary Rose said she does, but I do it only with things that are on paper. I work with a lot of people in the research room, and I'm basically working on whatever my researchers are working on. So whatever topics they come up with and anything that they might be looking for, try to help them track it down so I get to see a lot of cool stuff in my searching for other people. Excellent. Thank you. And so the archivists recently st um, put up a display in the lobby of the museum featuring different archives picks. Uh, what's kind of the motivation behind doing that? This is new here. I love seeing it. It's always exciting to see new little known things. Um, I won't say undiscovered, but thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the motivation behind doing that? It's really cool. Um, from what I understand, it was our new director, Alan Price's idea. He knows how much we get to see behind the scenes how much material we have that will never be on display or, you know, not for the foreseeable future, but we are looking at it every day and just in our conversations with each other and with our researchers and, you know, even you and other people who work in the building, people are aware that we get to see some really cool stuff. So we thought it would be a really great opportunity to show some of that to people who might not ever visit us in the research room or even, you know, necessarily go search our website. Now, if they're here in the museum, they can come and look at our, some of our favorite things. And there are captions in the display that I think everybody has an emotional connection to what they picked. It's like what appeals to me and this is why. And I, and I would say that's 
yeah, we haven't had that opportunity to, to share. And for me, it's like, yeah, well, I love that one. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. So it's kind of a, I, I feel, all of us probably feel that it's, it's, it's good to share our feelings and our, uh, I don't know, I just like it. <laughs> Yeah, we're as not, a way of telling people what I think. Or. I think we're not unaffected by the records that we have here, and we have our favorites for all kinds of reasons—the same favorites that some of our, you know, some of our social media fans have. But for other people, I've really liked seeing what my colleagues have picked because one of our digital archivists knows a lot about the history of photography, and one of her picks in our past round was had to do with the history of photography, which. I don't know anything about. So it was really fun for me to see her expertise in that area come through. So it's been a lot of fun for us. Yeah, it is nice to see the last round, I think, especially was you get an intro to the kind of the personalities of all of you where you see like with with Nicola and the photograph and other people's interests in a written word or composition of a photograph. It's been really neat to see. Or letters from kids to the president and I don't know, there's a special emotion there, I think. I don't know. Right, the textual documents and letters and things like that that people pick are always uh, interesting to see because uh, those are things that your average citizen probably isn't going to see anywhere else. We have some textual materials in the museum, but not a lot. But photographs can be more recognizable. But seeing especially you know, constituent mail and things like that, I think, is really uh, is interesting for people to see. And Laura, as somebody who does digitization and is working with what goes on the website, do you know roughly like how much is on, how much is online versus how much isn't or? Only a very small percentage is available online right now. So we have a lot of work to do, which is a a fun prospect for an archivist who loves doing this kind of work. So we have, in terms of photographs, we have over 500,000 photographs in our collections and only about 23,000 of them are available online right now. So there's a long way to go. And there's, I'm sure, lots more cool stuff in there. Yeah. I love how Laura says only about 20,000. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no big deal. It's like, you know, years of work to yes. just get that yeah. material and out. So I know, so from behind the scenes, like I do our social media and often we'll have to search for, it's National Waffle Day. And I have to, you know, look up the word waffle and lo and behold, thank you, metadata catalogers. Or facial hair. Waffle. Or that facial was hair, a, anything. Was a JFK smiling. Yes, yeah. hands in his pockets, wearing a hat, all these things. It's fabulous. We love to try to get those things into our descriptions so that when people are searching for something, they can find it. I really appreciate it. So to get into the whole meat of this episode, um, your actual pics. So there's some photographs, some documents. If anybody wants to go first and talk about what they picked. This is Mary Rose again. I, I uh, picked a photograph that I've always kind of loved. I've been here 16 years and just certain things hit you from the start. And um, It's a picture of a Christmas tree in the Blue Room from 1961. Blue Room in the White House. And I just love blue. I don't know. Blue for winter. Blue. There's something about it. It's just a really beautiful picture. It's very evocative of winter, the austerity of winter, perhaps. I I don't know. I don't know what that is. I was thinking there must be a poem that Robert Frost might have written about blue and winter. He did, you know, stop by the woods in a snowy evening, and, and he actually wrote a poem I knew of from when I was a kid doing stuff in school, and it's called Blue Butterfly Day, and it's about spring and how butterflies are coming in like flakes, you know, but that's Not quite right. But I was thinking, well, maybe he has something about winter. So I went looking online, and instead of Robert Frost, I found a poem by another New Englander by the name of Robert Francis, who was contemporary. And actually, they kind of had parallel writing styles, meter and rhyme, that kind of thing. Kind of quirky, if that's the right word, just the way the things were laid out, the sentences and the words. So I I don't know if I should read it. Yeah, why don't you read it? Yeah, it's called Blue Winter by Robert Francis. He's, again, he was kind of unsung. Robert Frost got all the glory, and he was kind of happy not to be quite as promoted or be in the the limelight, so to speak, but he's definitely an unsung poet compared to Robert Frost. Anyway, Blue Winter by Robert Francis. Winter uses all the blues there are, one shade of blue for water, one for ice, another blue for shadows over snow. The clear or cloudy sky uses blue twice, 
both different blues, and hills row after row. Our colored blue according to how far. You know the blue jay's double blue device shows best when there are no green leaves to show. And Sirius is a winter blue-green star. That's delightful. Thank you. Oh, I know, I want to clap now. I know. Very, nice. <laughs> very, very New england Robert Frosty, yeah. but it's yes. actually Robert Francis. It does fit the feel of that photo. For our listeners, we'll have a link to actually the Archivist blog post, which will have all of these pieces in it so you can see for yourselves. But yeah, the blue in that, co- that photograph is just incredible. Laura, do you want to share your photograph? Sure. Um, So the photo that I selected is a photograph from 1962, Christmas Day, and it is the Kennedy family celebrating Christmas in Palm Beach. And the photo is a family photograph featuring President Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, their children, as well as the First Lady's sister, Lee Radswell, and her husband and her children, as well as the family dogs. And there is also a family friend who is the son of Mrs. Kennedy's assistant. And he and his mother were celebrating Christmas as well with, with the Kennedys in Palm Beach. And I like this photograph because there is so much in it that might not be your standard Christmas um, The president's wearing a tie. I don't think most people wear ties on Christmas morning while they're opening gifts. Oil painting on the wall, the Christmas tree is huge. But there are so many relatable things in the photograph as well. Mrs. Kennedy is reaching for one of the dogs that is, you know, eating something on the floor maybe. Um, John Jr. is trying on his mother's sandal and no one's really looking at the camera. And if you look at this photograph on our website, you'll see there are numerous takes of this same pose, and in none of them is everyone looking, um, <laughs> which is a lot like any family's Christmas morning, I think. And what initially drew me to it was, is John Jr. right front and center uh, with his foot in his mother's flip-flop, because that's something that my two-year-old daughter likes to do. And so it just kind of, um, I related to it in that way. And it's also bittersweet because this is the family's last Christmas together before the president was killed in 1963. So there's a, a, a lot to feel when looking at this at this photo. And I just, uh, I like that it's a family on Christmas. Right. And I think there's lots of, we see plenty of very posed, choreographed photographs of the family. And this is just like, there's two dogs doing what dogs do. There's kids doing what kids do. And the adults are just trying to wrangle everybody. Yep. The, the, the German Shepherd Clipper uh, was... <laughs> notoriously uh, in need of, well, apparently went to, and I don't know how it worked out, but obedience school was definitely in need of yes. obedience <laughs> He's definitely He training. definitely has something in his mouth in this <laughs> that maybe he shouldn't have in his mouth, and that could be why the yep. first lady is, is reaching for him. Like, oh, God, what's happening? Um, and Whatever. the children are Team dressed Clipper. up for their yes. for their, um, <laughs> The children are dressed up for a Christmas pageant that they performed for all of their family that morning. Right. So. Yeah, that's a, a fun folder of photographs to look through, too. Yes. You see that progression of the trying to get the family photo, the doing the, like, nativity yep. little pageant. Yep, yep. And, and other family members, um, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. is there, Rose Kennedy is there, Eunice Sh- Kennedy Schreiber, the president's sister, and... When you get to the end of the series of photos, there are some very fun photos of later in the day, I believe, when they uh, went out on the presidential yacht, the Honey Fits, and um, the First Lady went water skiing, and we do have a photograph of Not that. your typical Christmas morning, no, certainly. No, no, not That's that That's where part. we yeah. get not relatable. Yeah. You don't want to try that in New England. <laughs> no. Yeah, no thanks. Definitely not. <laughs> All right, so Stacy, you have two documents for us. Yeah. I got. I, I can't pick sometimes, so I, I wind up with two staff picks in the in the picks display. But one of mine, because this was sort of a a fall and winter themed display, I had to go with one of my like longtime favorite documents here, which is a response that the Kennedy administration had sent to an eight-year-old girl who wrote a letter to John F. Kennedy in October 1961. She obviously um, has the original signed letter from the president, but we have the carbon copy here. So that's what I picked to go on display. Um, It is one of my favorite response letters I think I've ever seen to a constituent, and I've seen a lot of them. Should I read it? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So it starts, Dear Michelle, I was glad to get your letter about trying to stop the Russians from bombing the North Pole and risking the life of Santa Claus. I share your concern about the atmospheric testing of the Soviet Union, not only for the North Pole, but for countries throughout the world, not only for Santa Claus, but for people throughout the world. 
However, you must not worry about Santa Claus. I talked with him yesterday, and he is fine. He will be making his rounds again this Christmas. Sincerely, John Kennedy. That's adorable. I know. It's so, <laughs> it's so poignant, too. Yeah, so there's some backstory here, of course. So earlier in October, the Soviet Union had announced that they were going to do some nuclear testing. They were actually going to detonate the world's largest nuclear bomb in the air above the Arctic Circle. And so a few days later, the White House issues a press release as a response saying that testing a weapon this large could serve no legitimate purpose, is what they said. So this definitely got the attention of the press, as it was supposed to, went out in a press release. And so Michelle, we know from um, some contemporary newspaper coverage, she heard her parents talking about this in her small town in her living room in Michigan. And it really concerned her when she heard that this was going to be happening near the North Pole because, you know, there's a VIP up there that you need to, you need to consider. Mm -hmm. And so she said she sat right down, wrote JFK this letter, and it actually got into the press before this response even went out. So the response was handled through the White House press office, and you can see that through the various notations in the carbon copy. But there's something about the response that is... I really love it. It's It's got like this whimsical quality to it that we don't see a lot in textual material just because, you know, it's a presidential administration. There's serious stuff going on. Right. But then you get this, you know, nice little indication that the president can just call up Santa and make sure that, you know, he's doing okay. And it's just very reassuring, very, I don't know, kind of unexpected thing to find in the archives. Yeah. And you remember that, oh, yeah, JF, you know, President Kenny has small children, too. He's talking about Santa with his kids probably and wondering what's happening, you know, what he's doing up there. Yeah. That's delightful. Also terrifying that a child would have to do that. It's would true. Would be so and concerned. And yeah, this was um, obviously a really big topic on the minds of not just Americans, even as JFK indicated in the letter, people around the world were really worried about this. And the United States was also still doing nuclear testing at this time. So a few years later in, in the Kennedy administration, we had the limited or the nuclear test ban treaty. But at this time, there wasn't, you know, really anything like that. And there was work in that direction. But people were, were very concerned about this. So it makes sense to me that even a child as young as an eight-year-old would have been really worried about it. Yeah. Um, we don't have her original letter here, or we haven't found it yet anyway, but we do know what she said because it got picked up by the press. So her original letter was really short and it just said, Dear Mr. Kennedy, please stop the Russians from bombing the North Pole because they will kill Santa Claus. I am eight years old. I am in the third grade at Holy Cross School. And that was it. Yeah, well. <laughs> Which is very typical of a lot of the letters we see from kids in the yeah. archives. So just a few random facts about them. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, bye. Here's my question. <laughs> or they yeah. said, you know, tell John... Junior, I said hello or tell Carol. Oh, yes. And tell Mrs. Kennedy she is pretty. <laughs> we see that a lot, too. <laughs> and then you have another um, document for us as well, which I'm very excited about. We use this on social media, and it always gets some good responses. Yeah, I really like this one. So this is, it's one page, and it's a draft that holds two different messages for the holidays that would be sent out of the White House. And in the Kennedy administration, they actually have one draft that's labeled Christian recipients, and the other one is labeled non-Christian recipients. And this is for obvious reasons, right? They want to make sure that they have something that is thoughtful and appropriate to send to anybody who might send them a holiday greeting of any kind. And especially, you know, they're dealing with people from around the world, from all across the country, and they wanted to make sure they could, you know, send something thoughtful to everybody. So the one for Christian recipients says, we send you our heartiest greetings for this holy Christmas season. And the one for non-Christian recipients says, we join in wishing you and your family a very joyful holiday season. So I, I really like the inclusivity of, of this tactic. It's right here on the same page, both of these drafts. But it also, I think, is demonstrative of what we see a lot in the archives and in communications and in the press office is really a lot of thought went into even sort of these mundane everyday things that that we all maybe don't even think that much about is like, oh, what's our holiday greeting card going to say? They actually had several staff members work on that and, and write out these options for them. That's great. And also, I mean, just the thought between 
making sure you have an inclusive message for all people. And then also, you know, how do you answer an eight year old and how do you answer somebody who's scared about something or needs help or is mad at you? Like, you don't just blow them off. You write something that's, that's uh, constructive. Yeah. So behind the president, you know, he's he and occasionally the first lady, they're signing these things and putting their names on them. But there's a whole team of people who, depending on the topic, would be brought in to think up of responses to these, you know, these kind of questions. Anyone with any subject expertise, you know, if people are writing in about civil rights, maybe JFK's civil rights assistant will respond. I'm really lucky on the archive side, I get to see like the machine behind the presidency um, and really that it's a it's a group effort. One thing that was really interesting is um, when I scanned that photo or that um, when I scanned that document for you um, in that folder, Thank you. you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> in that folder, there were uh, it was a lot of Christmas and holiday drafts of letters and things like that. And there was this would have been my other pick if I uh, had chosen another one, but there was a telegram that was, I'm not sure who exactly wrote it or who it went to, but it was um, basically instructing um, whoever was responsible for sending out these letters to make sure that they had a list of na names for everyone who assisted in getting James Meredith into school the day that he arrived at the University of Mississippi. And it said, make sure they get individualized holiday message card from the president. Um, he wanted to single out all of the people who helped make that a reality. So, And, that was and they did do that. We have a carbon copy of every single one of those letters, and there are hundreds of them. Yeah. So that was a fun thing to find when I was looking through that folder. Yeah. That's, I, know, just, I think I'm always struck by the thoughtfulness of President Kennedy and the people with him. And I think it wouldn't be there without him, but I think he had a great team to make sure that all of this happened. I remember one thing coming across, too, is the gifts for, I think, White House staff. One time it was like customized shirts or something that they got, and they have all their measurements and mm -hmm. monograms and just the amount of detail that goes into a huge staff like that is, is Yeah, those something. were the, the gifts for the Secret Service agents. Oh, Secret Service, that's yeah, right. Yeah, Mrs. Kennedy in her papers has a folder that's devoted just to Christmas gifts that they were going to give to other people. And I think it was the Secret Service agents and like maybe some of the domestic staff, mm -hmm. the White House doorman and people like that. So they have all their measurements all listed on this really long document. Yeah. It's, yeah, very, it's a lot of work, a lot of effort went into even just these little. Yes. Well, I want to thank you all so much for your hard work and thoughtfulness that went into this. I know of all the thousands of things you've come across, these are some really great personal um, favorites of yours. And again, we'll link your blog post in our show notes so people can actually see them. Um, and we will hope to have you back again for some other round of Archives Picks in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of JFK 35. This is our last episode of this season. We'll be taking a little break and we'll see you in February. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at JFK Library using the hashtag JFK35. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening and have a happy new year.